Good afternoon, short-term shoppers. You are now in the short-term show special episode series on the Western North Carolina mountains. So this is everywhere from Asheville all the way down to Bryson City, basically that entire southwestern corner of the state. We're going to be doing a deep dive, 10 episodes worth of content on investing in this part of North Carolina. Now, we do have some supplemental materials for you over on our website, things like purchase prices of investment properties in this market, as well as the AirDNA income data. Thank you, friends over at AirDNA. So if you guys want to know uh, what all of these properties cost, you know, the different purchase prices, you can see that on the shorttermshop.com, as well as the income data. You can find that there too. If you guys want to buy an investment property in Western North Carolina with a short-term shop agent, email us at agents at the shorttermshop.com and we will get you hooked up. Or if you just have more questions, you want to come hang out with us some more. We've got a great Facebook group with a wonderful community of investors over at short-term rental, long-term wealth, same title as my book. And if you guys want to chat with us live anytime, we've got a call every Thursday and you can join that at strquestions.com. We look forward to seeing you over there. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Short Term Show special episode series on Western North Carolina. Again, we've got a pretty awesome panel. You're familiar with all of them, but I will let them introduce themselves really quick, starting with Mr. Joe Prilliman. Hello, hello, hello. Thanks for having me back again, Avery. Uh, my name is Joe. I am one of the short-term shop agents in the Carolina Beach market and a real estate investor myself. Got a number of properties kind of in the mountains of North Carolina and uh, across the state. And got some beach properties as well and happy to be here. Thanks, Joe. And next, the old familiar face, our Western North Carolina agent, Jay. Say hello. Everybody already knows who you are. They can't hey, I'm see J- <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm Jay. Jay Lawrence. Uh, I'm the what the agent out here in awesome Western North Carolina. I, I own some properties over here as well, and uh, hopefully we can crush a deal. Sweet. And next we have another not as familiar face, but if you've been paying attention, then you will recognize her. Kimmy McBurney, introduce yourself really quick. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Kimmy McBurney, American Eagle Home Inspection, a home inspection firm based here in Western North Carolina. And you're also a GC, right? I am. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So today, guys, we're going to be talking about Western North Carolina. You've already bought your property. You're getting started managing. We're going to talk about some of the common things that might jump up and bite you maintenance wise or just general snafus that are pretty easy to take care of. Or, you know, just things that you're going to deal with when you're managing a property in this part of the country. So to start off, my first question is about wildlife problems. So that can be pests, that can be, by pests, I mean insects, or it can be mice, or it can be flying squirrels. So what do we see uh, in relation to wildlife that has to be managed in these properties? Definitely in the properties that are more rural, there are bear problems. Now, we don't suffer from the hyena problem like high country, but, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bears can be a problem and you really want to, you know, have a system in place that will keep your trash safe. You know, like, I mean, it's not that I mean, they're horribly destructive for one, but, you know, they'll just you, you hate to have a guest roll up next. And then like there's just trash everywhere. So, um, you know, and we do have trash pandas that are raccoons that come up here and, you know, they're they're not as bad, but they, they can be destructive, too. And, tr- you know, trying to get in your trash cans as well you know, uh, skunks and they're just bad to have around in general. So hopefully you don't run into one. So what do you do to quote, protect your trash from these, these animals? Typically, um, it, what I see on these is they'll be tra- the, like a, people will build like a box with a metal gate or grate on top of the trash can. That way the bears can't like, I mean, you know, obviously Big giant bears can maybe rip it apart, but it's it's a good thing to you know have in place to deter them from doing that. But some way to lock your trash up. I mean, the best policy really is is just to have your trash collection or your cleaners or whoever does it just dispose of it as quick as possible and just not have it. But you know that's not always going to be an option when you're staying for like a week or something. So you're gonna have to, you're gonna be filling up your trash cans. Um, yeah, bears are definitely a thing. Because like I've come a couple times, I pulled up my camera and we have these little uh, buckets 
where the bears like to play with them. And so I keep salting them for if there's like potential ice and whatnot. And so they've been uh, kicking those around my property, but um, it's just making sure you have locked bear cages. Cause once they find food, they're always going to come back to it. Always. And so it's really making sure that they are away from anything that they like to eat and that'll keep them from coming back to your property. Absolutely. I used to have, a, I, I built the compost for uh, the house I had out in the country and that, they would always come out and knock that damn thing over. I had to like stake it to the ground, you know, cause you're throwing rotten food out there and that's a place to eat. So. Yeah. And I'll third that. Um, a lot of the popular trash vendors around here do sell bear proof trash cans. Um, you do have to pay a couple extra bucks, but I highly recommend that we had ours in a chain link enclosure the bear was like that's cute and just peeled it back and got in the trash anyway so highly recommend the bear proof trash cans um other than that i feel like yeah pet, i mean we have pest issues year round but that's why they carpenter bees. yeah highly recommend pest inspection carpenter bees you set the traps you know termites you can get the treatments very treatable just be aware of the issues for sure yeah i will always highly 100 percent push and recommend that you get a pest treatment done or not a treatment uh, inspection in a treatment if necessary but yeah actually that's a good point treatment so at my house we do may through august um mosquito outdoor mosquito i think that would be popular and then i also do a monthly pest treatment where a pest company will monitor and they'll be responsible for any upkeep so i think yeah with a with a rental property i think that would be key especially if you have standing water um mm-hmm. they can mosquitoes in the summer that's a great point yeah and if the house was built with a termite bond i would always 100 percent recommend taking that bond over they are transferable when you buy the property you just have to call up and say hey i'm going to take this over and um you know it, it's good kimmy let's say theoretically i've got a, a groundhog that lives underneath mine um <laughs> you guys you guys deal with those theoretically i don't i'm curious ask your pest guy so we had a pest inspector we had bad moles so the moles would eat up the grass he said you put pinwheels like those old, like little kids pinwheels that you get at the fair, you stick them in the ground and the vibrations of the pinwheels um, will deter underground pests. So maybe that'll yeah. scare your groundhog away, but a good one for moles because that jogs my memory that moles are an issue as well. Joe, he's a mascot at this point. Like it would behoove you to keep him around. Just let him keep running through the reviews. I mean, he's, you do speak of him rather fondly. Now. Endearingly, yeah. in fact. See, yeah. that's the thing. It's like, I, I would be sad if he was gone, but it's kind of like, I'd hate to see him go, but I'd love to watch him leave. So <laughs> we'll see how it goes. It's like Caddyshack. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's talk. One of you mentioned carpenter bees. How do we keep those away? Can we keep them away? And then how do we repair the damage that they've done? Who does that? Um, I see. A, so, you know, you can fill in the holes that they do, um, you know, I think that they did, it's a standard pest treatment to kill them around there. There, There's also traps that you can install that the carpenter bees will be drawn to and get trapped in there and die. Um, that's not a hundred percent, you know, deterrent for them because that's only going to get some of them, but they're still going to find the wood and try to get in there. But I've always seen people, they plug it up, you know, they fill in the holes, you know, and repair the damage. And um, Kimmy, uh, do you guys, uh, he's, I know you work pretty close with a pest inspector and uh, do you know how they do it? Yeah, same. I'd refer to them. I do believe there is some sort of topical treatment that you can put on quarterly or annually, but 100%, I think the most effective common solution we see are the traps. So they almost look like, yeah, like the little hanging and they almost look like a bird feeder, but it's a trap. Um, And then obviously repairing the damage is going to prevent it from spreading. But I think traps would be my number one solution I see. Yeah, I just looked at the property yesterday and they had a nice place and, and I could see where the carpenter bees were a problem, but they had those traps all around it. And I could actually see live carpenter bees trapped in there at that time when I was there. It's pretty cool um, how they do it, but they are, they're, they're a nuisance up here. And the, the suck part is, is they look like bumblebees and they're not, and they can't sting you. So they're just a pain. <laughs> Yeah, they are. So any other type of insects that we have to deal with? Do you guys have ladybugs that come in at certain parts of the year and you can't get them out? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, we do have, I, I never really have or heard or seen much of, you know, them infesting inside of a dwelling, but I mean, there'll be more out like in your garage or, you know, out underneath your house or something. And, you know, to be honest, it's actually one of the better infestations to have because they do actually eat aphids and keep your garden clean and stuff. So they are nice to have around, but you know, unsightly when they start swarming. Yeah. I saw one house with hundreds 
It was actually the first time I've seen it. We don't see it often, say, you know, we do hundreds a year and and maybe see it once, but um, but it happens. But again, yeah, most of the every, best experts in here, you know, deal with that kind of stuff. I'd say every couple of years, you'll see the ladybug swarms. Uh, I think two years ago, we had one that, where I live. I, I remember that. Well, while we're on the subject of insects, let's talk about the dreaded B word, bed bugs. So I like to say it's not a question of if you're going to get bed bugs, it's when. when. And when that happens in this market, what are we doing? Who are we calling? How do we prevent them? Um, you know, honestly, you know, when I go and stay in a hotel or something like that, I always put my luggage up high. I don't want, <laughs> I, used to work, I used to work in Oklahoma and where the, there was like a pandemic of bed bugs and it just, it skeezes me out to think about bed bugs, right? So, you know. There's there's always like little things you can do. You can put like the the dishes around the bed, you know, the, the corners, the diatomaceous earth, because that's a very big deterrent for them because it desiccates them and dries them out and kills them and even kills their eggs. Um, but you're right, it's it's when you get them. But fortunately, you know, in North Carolina, it's not a, a huge it's not a huge pandemic of bed bugs up here like it was Oklahoma. Oklahoma's ridiculous. It, well, Oklahoma City anyway. I don't know about Broken Bow. <laughs> But, uh, you know, they're, they're just, you know, keep things clean, you know, a good change every time. Um, it only takes one. It only takes one. But, yeah, make, your cleaners are cleaning and keeping things thorough. So, um, yeah. Um, and my advice, too, would be like always, always have the zippered mattress encasements, not just the elastic that goes over the top. Like it completely encases the mattress and also the, the uh, pillows, if you can. And, um, your cleaner should be looking every, every turn, like pulling the covers back and kind of looking for blood spots. spots. Because, yeah. Yeah. That's what will kind of alert you to them. And also when you get them guys, it's kind of pointless to try and figure out where they came from or who brought them in. Like you can get bed bugs at an airport from other people's luggage. Yeah. So it's, it's not a like, oh my gosh, it's so dirty. It, it does. It's not a reflect. And the biggest thing guys is don't go yell at your cleaners. Cause it's not a reflection of your cleaners. Like it's mm. not really something you can know exists until it's a full on infestation. So it's just a thing that happens. Don't yell at your cleaners. It's usually not their fault. It, like I said, not you can get at it all. Airports. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. Um, mm. Oh, go ahead, Jay. Yeah. And I was going to say with the luxury of owning a short-term rental and getting bed bugs, it's going to be a little easier for you to get rid of them because then you just block off a schedule. There's not going to be anybody there. There's not going to be anybody to feed them. It's going to be easier to let them die out. Like opposed to if you lived in that house, because, you know, if you live in the house, you have to take all these measures that you have to live by for like a month, you know, and to get rid of them completely. But if there's nobody there, you're essentially starving them out and it's going to be easier to kill them. And what are we typically doing to treat Kimmy? Is this typically a, a heat market where most of the uh, the pest control people will use heat or do they use chemicals or what's the protocol usually? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I usually deal with unoccupied homes. So this is a little out of my purview. <laughs> well, I mean, they're technically going to be unoccupied when it like, cause what will happen is Airbnb or Verbo will make you cancel your next few uh, guests in order to deal with it while it's being treated. So usually at least in, I've gotten them in two markets that I own a beach market and a mountain market, and we've had to get heat and um, also chemicals. And then we've, when we've had them, we've replaced, like we go ahead and replace the mattresses and replace couches so we've replaced a lot of things that probably aren't necessary to just make sure there wasn't one hanging out like in the couch to to reinfect. But um, yeah, just curious if you guys have any other different just processes. Takes one. Um, typically, what I've seen up here is it's more of a chemical treat. Um, I, I haven't I haven't really looked into it much, but I don't see like the heat treatments very often. It's more of like that uh, that desiccating and the steam treatments. Um, not necessarily heat in the whole room, but that steam gun, you know, going over everything with that hot steam. So, all right. Well, moving on, we've so, seen them in the uh, upholstered headboards as well. Oh, mm -hmm. yep, yep. Mm -hmm. That's, we've had to get rid of our upholstered headboards, and it sucks because they look. I, I like the way upholstered headboards look, but it's just another place for them to be. So we just switched to to wood headboards. Yeah, and they don't climb very well. So. 
you know, as a guest or whatever, even it's good practice just to put your luggage up high or hang up your clothes because they don't climb very well. I mean, they can climb up your bedpost, but, you know, it's just ways to avoid bringing them with you if you, there is a situation like that. So good to know. All right, let's move on to other types of maintenance problems that might come up. So let's talk about the ones related to ice and snow. So is is snow removal really something that has to be done often up here or is it like once a year or, or what's the deal with snow removal uh, it doesn't snow as much as it used to like 10 years ago up here but we do sometimes usually get like one good snow and um a lot of the um you know the city streets are plowed uh, a lot of the communities will have an hoa road maintenance agreement in place to get rid of that snow i mean you're still responsible for your own driveway so that is a uh common occurrence for, you know, something you have to take in account, uh, account when, when it snows, you know, you might have to have some your maintenance man or somebody go out there and, you know, treat your own driveway. But uh, um, yeah, it's, it's not too bad. I mean, we're in the mountains. We have plans in place to get this, get the snow out of the way. Cause I mean, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get home or to your cabin or whatever. What about when it's like your personal driveway or just the the private road up to it if you're not on an actual county road? Is that an HOA thing or like who are we calling if we just need our driveway to be shoveled off? Oh, you know, there's millions of people on standby when it snows up here, like just independent people ready to jump and go plow. So, I mean, there are, you know, it's a simple Google search to find, you know, it's also word of mouth, uh, lots of advertising for snow removal. So yeah, awesome. we'll reach out to our local handyman that we have on site or not on site, but like around in the area. And so we'll reach out to them, have them come and put some salt and scrape and whatnot when it comes around. All right. So, so it's probably a lot of like preventative too. So you typically have some notice if it's going to snow or ice and you can get out there and get that salt down first and then take the other measure measures later, almost the measurements. Um, all right. Anything else related to snow or ice? What about pipes? Um, are pipes typically exposed in crawl spaces or their basements that keep them warm? Or is this an area where we have to worry about pipes bursting? That's a good one for Kimmy. <laughs> <laughs> like, did you see my eyes get big? Yeah, yeah. You got big. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Snow. I mean, I think this year we didn't even have any snow, right? And it's so, mm. so infrequent that, yeah, most people just kind of deal with it as we go. But 100%, especially this winter, we had some extreme cold snaps. Um, especially with vacation rentals, things Negative that are occupied two. for short periods of time. Um, yeah, huge problem. And yeah, we're not built for it. Not a, um, a lot of the pipes, like you said, are exposed in crawl spaces. So we see it a lot. So a lot of dewinterizing, we re we rewinterizing. I mean, if someone's not going to be there running the pipes, you should absolutely have a protocol in place to have it winterized. You know, it it it, it could be 24 hours. It can make the difference. So absolutely. That's something to be aware of. Leave instructions to keep like the, the sink on drip or something. Yeah. Yeah, but absolutely. We weren't prepared for that negative two <laughs> cold snap that came through in December. I know, Joe, you had some issues too with that one. Uh, it was it was rough. Yeah, Pipes I don't want to talk about everywhere. it. It was horrible. <laughs> Pipes leaking. I mean, it was everything. It was terrible. Ruined my Christmas. So how is a property winterized or re-winterized, Kimmy? What, like, what are the things that are done? Yeah, I'm essentially you're draining the water from the system. That's pretty much it. You know, making sure all the water is is out of the pipes. Um, that's pretty. That's the most common. I mean, some people go, you know, a step above depending on the structure and or like if they're winterizing RVs or you know more remote properties, you can use antifreeze and stuff. But that's if you're not there. I mean, lastly, I guess if somebody you know really wanted to say, I don't want to ever deal with this problem ever again. You know, in construction, we do use heat trace tape. I don't see it a lot in residential applications, but essentially it's, you know, a, a, a wire that's run along your pipes to essentially heat it and keep it from freezing. But the most common is just essentially draining, you know, using that whole house shut off to make sure the water is out of the home. So when we get these cold snaps, because it does happen, I, maybe not every year, but ev it will happen enough to have to think about. Are these properties typically on electric heat pumps or are they heated in some other way? Yes. <laughs> it's a mix of both. Like okay. it really just depends on where you're at and how high you're up. And, you know, you know, I know I live in Waynesville, so all of Waynesville is the country. So unless you're like right in Waynesville proper, you're on a well. So, or, he, you know, 
a pump that you know electric pump uh, out that way so, yeah so i'm talking about like a the actual ac unit like is it a heat pump um oh gotcha sorry yeah, not, yeah. not an actual well <laughs> sorry sorry i am um, gonna get well. to that i'm gonna get to that yeah, sorry um yeah yeah we do have a lot of heat pumps up here and you know honestly you don't a lot of places don't have central heat in there you know they might be heated by propane or um yeah, it's very rarely, I think, you know, I know one of my robberies heated by kerosene, which is old school, but, uh, you know, it just depends really. And up here, it doesn't get really above 85. So a lot of the older homes doesn't even really have a unit in them. So if you have one of those houses, then you don't have anything. Yeah. So yeah. what I was getting at with the heat pump thing is a lot of times when it gets that cold, since we're in the Southeast here, a lot of these the houses just aren't built to deal with being that cold all the time. So what will happen is your guests will start calling and saying, Hey, the heat's not working. It's only, you know, it's stuck at 65 when really it's not that it's not working. It's just colder than this house was meant to be dealing with. And so it's just not quite keeping up. So Kimmy, are there any ways that you can get around that or help mitigate when that does start to happen? Because it is going to happen at some point. Yeah, that's tough. And uh, yeah, so we not only see heat pumps, we see electric baseboard heaters, we see split units, stuff like that. Um, I think knowing your property and being prepared for that. Um, some people have the wood stoves. Some people have fireplaces, which those aren't very efficient. Um, I know space heaters, which probably are not ideal for, you know, tenant occupied issues. But, you know, if you have to supplement with those. Um, but like, for example, when I bought our house, it's 3000 square feet. You know, the loft just wasn't efficiently heated. So we added a mini split. You know, sometimes like popular. you said, the older homes, you didn't prepare for it. If you're investing money in a short-term rental, you know, you may want to go the extra mile and put those individually controlled split units. Um, but other than that, really for those offhand cold snaps, we kind of just have to deal with it. Mini splits are very popular up here. Yeah, I see them a lot. Especially in the, I mean, a lot of the cabins, you know, the cute mm-hmm. little kitschy places don't have, like you said, they weren't be- built with duct systems. So <laughs> those mini splits. And then each guest gets con- to control their own. So it's a win-win. <laughs> Frontier people grew up in that house and now it's been redone to be a short-term rental. Yeah. Exactly. We were a much tougher human race back then than we are yeah. now. <laughs> we don't need no central heat and air. <laughs> All right. So let's move on back to the well pumps. Let's move on to common well issues. So what are some common issues that we might run into owning a property up here when it comes to being on a well? Um, if you're on a shared well, the, I mean, you could run into pressure issues, um, you know, running out of water just depends on the well, really. Um, you know, on a shared well, I would always recommend putting a holding tank in to give you a little bit of extra oomph while your guests are here. Um, and always put a filter on your end, uh, even though that your shared well might have a filter on it. I'd just be double cautious with that. Not that our water has a lot of GRD in it because it's so cold up here, but uh And that's just good practice to have that on there. Um, So what about uh, well filters? Do handymen, or actually, let me back up a little bit. Do y'all typically have, do you typically see the cartridge well filters or the salt well filtration systems or both? uh, Both. Uh, I actually went and looked at a house yesterday. I had a cartridge on the well. So, I mean, uh, you know, from what I see, when I see houses, there's a little mixture of both really. I don't know. And what about you? What do you see in the home inspections, Kimmy, mostly? Yeah, we see a lot. We see a good mix. So once again, just being preventative. And when you buy the property, one, have the well inspected. Wells have 74 plus moving parts and pieces. People don't realize how many things can go wrong. Um, So I think that's key. I think the things we see fail the most are pressure gauges, expansion tanks, stuff like that. Um, But then also getting your water quality tested. Um, I grew up on city water. When I moved here, I didn't realize that was a thing. I just assumed all of the water from the earth was wonderful. Um, So I've owned a range of properties. Sometimes they just need a sediment filter, which is great. Um, But I do live in a home right now that has a $6,000, you know, salt water filtration system because we were in a hot spot of lead, you know, and and iron. Iron was big. We see that a lot here. We get a lot of homes with the rotten egg smell, 100% treatable, uh, manageable. But if you do have a property on the salt system, you're going to have to remember to have somebody maintaining and, you know, refilling your salt. So I think those are probably the most common, but once again, super preventable and treatable. You just have to be aware of what you've got and plan for the maintenance. Yeah. We have a lot of iron up here. You can make a lot of axes with that. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, are you guys typically what the vendor that you call to handle this? Do the handy people out there handle a lot of this stuff, or do you have to call an actual well company? Because I know in some markets it's an actual well company, in some markets, most of the handymen are pretty familiar with how to change a cartridge or how to put the salt in and you call them. So what's typical around here? I'm, I'm not sure. You don't, you don't need the license for it. I mean, if your handyman knows how to do it, um, I, I don't think there's a problem with them doing that. I think yeah, I typical. agree. I think most handyman, especially the sediment filters, those are definitely very easy. Or a lot of plumbers, or if you like have a, a handyman who is more keen on plumbing, a hundred percent. It's something that, you know, a non-licensed professional can do. Definitely. All right. So let's switch gears and talk about, I always put them in the same category, even though they're not the same thing, uh, septic systems. So pretty much I would say, you know, the majority of properties in these markets that are outside city limits are going to be on septic systems. So 70%. Yeah. So those can have problems occasionally. Sometimes they are going to require maintenance. Are there any, is there anything that is more typical than not when it comes to common septic problems in this market, Kimmy? I would say if I ever talk to a short-term owner client, that is the first thing I always bring up is septic. I mean, I'm sure this is typical in any market, but 100% you need to budget and plan to pump annually. As you guys know, they treat it like a hotel. They won't flush anything and everything. (laughs) Um, And also most of the homes were built quite some time ago. So we've seen all sorts of interesting types of septic systems, but also they were probably built for a much less occupancy than you're utilizing it, which is fine. You just have to stay on top of the maintenance. And then once again, going back to when you buy the property, make sure you get an inspection to make sure you're starting off, you know, with a clean slate. And then upkeeping that maintenance, and that generally will keep you in the clear. Good advice. It's always best to stay out ahead of it. Make sure you're pumping it often, and um, all that fun stuff, all that fun septic stuff. Yeah. You Joe, know, you have a smirk. Is there something you'd like to add? Smirk. <laughs> He's like, no, I don't. Um, no, well, now you're laughing because my internet's messing up a little bit. Oh, oh okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. I'm, gotcha. It, I'm getting like a every smirk other of word. crazy. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Smirk of crazy. <laughs> um, common occurrence though, that can affect your, uh, your pumps. We have a lot of wilderness up here and, um, you know, it, not, not so much in the holding tank, but like in the, the, uh, pipes and stuff going from the holding tank in the house, you know, they can get roots and stuff in them and damaged because of the wildlife, especially if your septic is next to a giant tree. And now when you put that septic in, that tree could have been a little tiny sapling, but because it's got so much good stuff going on down there, now it's a giant tree after three years. But that can uh, that can affect your pipes down there. And uh, luckily, the, I mean, the cost to do some of this stuff, it's not horrible. Like it, it's very reasonable, I think, in my opinion, you know, you're not going to really have to replace a whole system. Yeah. Or you would know that on the front end with your septic inspection, but same with the roots. I agree. We get that quite a bit. Even with city sewer, we'll see roots in the system. Um, you can flush root killer. It's very economical, <laughs> less than a hundred bucks. If you want to just add that to your maintenance routine, especially if you're on a heavily wooded property, um, it, it doesn't hurt the system. So that's a good tip. Yeah. Gotcha. So septic is pretty straightforward. There's like a few things that can go wrong with it. Uh, I've actually had to have an entire septic system dug up and redone before. It was in a house that I lived in, but it's because it turns out they didn't do it right the first time when they put it in. But fun times, fun times. Um, so stay best best advice I can give you is stay upstream of any septic and well issues. Yeah, um, add that in your capex. You know, just budget for something. You know, put that in there that it could be a problem. Cool. Anything else? What have we not talked about that people run into often? Is it common to have internet outages or anything like that? I know it can be difficult to get internet, so you might have to go with some alternative options, which we talked about in another episode. But um, in the event that we, is there anything that causes the internet to go out often other than just you know losing power? Absolutely. Like just the other day, a couple of days, was it yesterday or the day before? I can't remember. Like the wind was so bad, like horrible bad, like Oklahoma City wind bad. Uh, and this is just a occurrence that I've noticed in the past few years, you know, the wind being this bad. So that can, I mean, it knocked a power line down. This was yesterday. No, it was Saturday. But um, it knocked a major power line down that knocked out internet, uh, you know, all the traffic lights. So um, definitely wind can be a factor. Um, 
ice and snow, icy conditions, it, you know, if there's a little rupture in the line that can cause internet problems when the temperatures drop, then in the line, just a little bit of water getting down in that line freezes and stops your internet. Um, you know, we don't bury lines up here for internet really a lot. Um, I know Zito Media, a lot of their lines are aerial. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure about Spectrum. Spectrum might bury some of their lines, but uh, um, that's the problem. If they're up on a pole and wind hits them, yeah, your your internet's done. I mean, if it was buried fiber, you're good to go. But uh, you know, in any condition, really. Um, but that also brings up wind too as a common occurrence. I guess it looks like the trend now. But you know, you want to kind of secure your deck furniture. You know, if you have a fire pit uh, chairs, you know, just something to, to keep them grounded because, you know, it'll knock off this wind the way it is. If it keeps going, it will knock over your, 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 uh, your lawn furniture and stuff and your deck furniture. So let's talk about what you have to do with your tech or, you know, access to the house to keep it online or not to keep it online, to keep it accessible when you're offline. So yeah, Schlag on codes and all of the other great wireless Wi-Fi locks are amazing, but you always, always, always need to have, I say two separate hidden keys in lock boxes on the property. So you always want to have it in a lock box because uh, you don't want people to just be able to dig around and find a key. You want them to actually have to let you know that they're looking for it so you can give them the code. So um, I recommend having one to two hidden just like rotary lock boxes, manual, manual lock box uh, rather than digital around the property. So in case anything happens with the internet, or maybe, you know, even if just your lock runs out of batteries, your guest has a way to say, oh my gosh, I'm locked out. And you say, no problem. Here's how you get in. Here's an alternative key. So uh, you want to keep that in mind. Uh, also, your your cameras can go offline. Uh, well, they will go offline if you lose internet. But when they come back on, if you have changed your internet Wi-Fi, like, sorry, your login from what it came with on the actual router when you bought it, sometimes it won't log back into the network that you created, like called, you know, like the good life or whatever your network is, and you have to revert it back. So that can be a little bit of a hang up with guests. So I would think about that and and test that when you're setting up that if your cameras go offline and they can't get logged back in on the network you created, maybe you just want to stick with the one that the username and password that's on the modem so the guests can always get to it. I don't know if that's ever happened to you guys. <laughs> you know, I think it's HughesNet is one of them. They will actually require somebody to be there for them to go do internet and to go in the house too. So that might be a conversation you might have with your handyman or something, if it, or if they'll, you know, allow that. Uh, I'm not sure about like the other big people, if they will require that, but uh, you might have to sign something saying, Hey, we're not responsible. Yeah. So just make sure guys that you have things in place for if the internet goes out to where your house is still accessible, because it's really, really fun to be connected and millennial or Gen Z or whatever you are. Uh, but also you gotta, you gotta go old school sometimes for when that internet fails. <laughs> Um, all right. So another thing that I wanted to talk about is driveway or potentially private road maintenance, particularly gravel. So a lot of people don't think about owning gravel roads and what it takes to maintain them. Uh, I've grew up living on gravel roads. So it, that's not something that has ever not occurred to me. But if you grew up in an area where, you know, maybe you live in the suburbs or in town and it's never, it's not something that's ever occurred to you, it may not occur to you when you buy a cabin out in North Carolina that, hey, you know, I have to actually, you know, get a truckload of gravel delivered every now and then or have it graded. So keep that in mind that if you buy on a private road, or a lot of times if, if it's a number of properties on a shared road agreement or on a road agreement, y'all will share in the cost of that. That's why it's a shared road agreement. Um, but specifically your own driveway, the gravel does not deliver itself. And so you need to know once a year, you need to take a look at it, especially after it's the rainy season, uh, because that can really cause some some erosion and things like that. So after the rainy season, I would recommend at least, you know, have, making sure you're cleaner if you're not going yourself gives you an update on what the gravel's like um, and if it, anything needs to be done with it. Yeah. Grading as well. Um, you don't necessarily always have to replace the gravel. You just need to grade it because we get those little ridges in the gravel, the, the road's fine. It's got enough gravel. It's just wavy. Um, you know, I think last I checked, it was about 50, $60 a ton or something like that. 
for gravel, you know, and delivery fees. Yeah. But this is something, you know, if your maintenance man is cool with and, you know, your driveway is not that long, it's something that they can probably handle. Um, you just have somebody deliver the gravel or they could, you know, if they got a pickup truck and they want to go do it, then awesome. Yeah. Anything else like that? We're kind of coming to the end of the points that I wanted to make sure we made. Uh, anything else, common occurrences, Kimmy, common things that you see that we haven't touched on? No, I think we've got them all. I mean, I'll tack on to the gravel too. I live on a gravel road. <laughs> um, but yeah, so gravel delivery, I agree, is relatively inexpensive, but it's the, getting the people with the equipment to spread the gravel that's going to cost you. So definitely being aware when purchasing a property, if that's going to be an issue. I mean, where I live in particular, I don't think we could get away with less than once a month having someone to maintain the road. We own equipment because we knew what we were getting into. So definitely be aware. And we have a shared road agreement. That doesn't mean everyone abides by it or cares about it. (laughs) So don't, yeah, definitely can't depend on neighbors. Um, But yeah, like I think Jay had mentioned with the snow, there's plenty of people around town that do it and can do it on on a maintenance schedule basis. So definitely if you're in one of those cool cabins that are off grid, you know, be aware of that cost. Um, the only other thing that kind of jogged my memory to go back to HVAC, um, since we do have seasons, you know, being aware of the changes between the seasons um, and service needs, like you had mentioned, if you buy a particular property when it's hot or cold, you cannot necessarily accurately test the other temperature. So if it's cold outside, you can't really test the AC. If it's hot, you can't really test the heat. Well, you can test the heat a little better than the AC. So just being prepared to, you know, to have your guests give feedback, your cleaning crew give feedback, making sure that's optimally performing and having that service. But other than that, I feel like you hit most of the big points for sure. Cool. Anybody else? Last call for things to to add. Otherwise, it's a a surprise for the listeners. Joe's Joe's about. (laughs) I mean, my internet never goes out, so we're totally fine. Don't worry about your internet's going to be totally fine up in the mountains all the time. (laughs) All the time. Um, all the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I did. I did have one more when you talked about internet. So yes, I agree. A lot of people are without internet today from these storms, um, but also power. I Where I live, we probably lose power twice a year, which is not, well, not often. It's only twice, but, you know, be prepared because like Jay said, our, our lines, our power lines are not buried here. Um, it does happen, um, especially in those cold snaps. And, you know, unfortunately the power company is not as responsive as we'd always like. So definitely always have a plan B you know, you see that weather rolling in to, to provide for your guests. Yeah, I get brownouts a lot where I'm at. Yeah, I mean, we see a lot of whole house generators too. I mean, once again, they're expensive, but $10,000 to assure you're never going to lose power. You know, it's something to consider for sure, but we see a lot of generators. Yeah, those are very common up here. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. all right. Thank you guys all for being here. Uh, Guys, uh, if you are interested in buying a house with Jay up in Western North Carolina, email agents at the shorttermshop.com. If you guys have just more questions on anything, we have office hours every Thursday. You can sign up at strquestions.com. And of course, we have our Facebook group. It's called Short-Term Rental, Long-Term Wealth. There are over 45,000 investors in there sharing their experiences. So hop on in there and join the fun. Thank you guys so much for coming. Take care. Bye. Thanks, guys.